Procedurally generated games rely heavily on coherent noise for generating their landscapes and terrain features. However, when more structured outcomes are desired, more constrained algorithms are typically used to produce more predictable results. Procedural structure generation has been a point of interest for me since I began designing my own voxel game engine back in 2018, as creating compelling dungeons, buildings, and landmarks is a key part of creating an engaging game. There are many dungeon generation algorithms out there already, but the system I was most intrigued to explore was Minecraft, given that it has such an important cultural position both in procedurally generated games and in game development as a whole. However, after learning how Minecraft generated its structures, I was struck by how limited its system actually was. Most unique structures in Minecraft rely on custom Java code in addition to its structure generation algorithm to patch the holes in its design. This wasn't an option for me when working on my own project, as I want to be able to define structures using a JavaScript API, and running JavaScript in a multi-threaded environment is a huge hassle. I wanted to design a structure system that was entirely data-driven, so that all of the specifications for a structure could be boiled down into serializable information that could be cached and sent to map generation threads. This study represents my exploration into this area, expanding on and augmenting Minecraft's structure generation algorithm by implementing numeric counters that can be used to define and constrain map generation. First, I'd like to quickly cover how Minecraft's structure generation system works, as it's pretty relevant for the rest of this talk. While I do think that it's unfortunately limited, the systems that it does have are quite elegant and form the basis for my more complex generation algorithm. Minecraft generates structures recursively, starting with a root structure, which may contain multiple attachment points for other substructures called jigsaw blocks. These attachment points reference pools of potential substructures which may be attached to them with variable probabilities. After the structure algorithm places a structure, it iterates through all the jigsaw blocks within it, selects a random structure from the pool of structures it can attach to, and then randomly selects an attachment on the chosen structure to connect to the source. This process repeats until there are either no more jigsaw blocks to attach to, the structure hits a hard-coded maximum volume, or there are no structures that can attach to the remaining jigsaw blocks that don't overlap already placed structures. This system works quite well for sprawling, non-directed structures like villages and dungeons. However, when more intentional constraints are desired, it offers very little control. For example, structures can't be required to meet a minimum or maximum size outside of the hard-coded size limit which applies to all structures. They also can't easily enforce invariants required for more traditional directed dungeons, such as ensuring that any locked door that spawns in a catacomb has a room preceding it with a key. In fact, you can't even be sure that the substructure will generate at all, even if it has a 100% probability on a jigsaw block that you know will be placed. Because if the substructure would overlap an already placed structure, the entire substructure will be discarded without any attempt to place it elsewhere. These limitations make it nearly impossible to generate structures with any sort of directionality or complex behavior, as can be seen by Minecraft's recent attempts at implementing more ambitious structures, which patch over the limitations of their generation system by having keys required to open dungeon doors drop from infinitely spawning enemies, instead of dedicated locations in the dungeon itself. Earlier structures in Minecraft encountered these limitations as well, but instead chose to solve them by writing arbitrary Java code to enforce structure-specific constraints, which leads to much less maintainable code and isn't applicable to my project due to the way that it's architected. I've put a lot of focus into optimizing map generation as much as possible in my voxel engine, as I want to be able to generate very large expanses of terrain in very little time. One of the ways that I've accomplished this is by heavily parallelizing the map gen threads. The map generator automatically allocates threads based on the number of machine cores available, meaning that I can't expect serial execution when generating structures. This effectively makes it impossible to run arbitrary code for individual structures, as all structures in my engine are defined in JavaScript and processed using the V8 runtime. V8 and other JavaScript runtimes are entirely single-threaded within a given context, and having a V8 context on each map gen thread would make it much heavier and introduce a lot of complexity for content creators, as data wouldn't be able to be shared between them. Instead, I decided to create a serialized structure format similar to Minecraft's, but with more powerful data-driven logic so that structure patterns and constraints could be represented in a serial format. The mechanism I settled on to accomplish this was counters. In my design, structures are able to create any number of numeric counters and assign any initial value to them. Any jigsaw block, called fixtures in my system, can then specify multiple substructures which can attach to it, which optionally depend on one or more counter values being set to a certain range or value. When a structure is chosen to be generated, it can mutate any existing counter by incrementing or decrementing it. For generation to complete, all initialized counters must reach zero. This feature is deceptively simple for the amount of flexibility it affords. 
Take the previous example of a dungeon with locked doors and keys. The structure generation can begin with a boss room, which initializes a locked door counter to some positive value. Then, as it generates rooms backwards towards the beginning, each room can potentially roll a locked door room attached to it if the locked door counter is greater than zero. Generating a locked door room decrements the locked doors counter and increments the keys counter, which was initially set to zero. And subsequent rooms will be able to roll a room containing a key to open the door if the keys counter is greater than zero itself. For the structure to be considered valid, all counters must hit zero, meaning that the locked door counter must reach zero by spawning however many locked doors we decided on, and the keys counter must reach zero by spawning exactly enough keys to open every door that was locked. If these constraints were not able to be met by the generator, the structure will be discarded, preventing impossible structures from generating at all. This was the core idea which I approached Professor Esty with when proposing the self-directed study. My pro forma included the following goals which I considered necessary to create a proof-of-concept implementation. Structure information can be loaded from files. Structure generation can somehow be invoked to place a structure in the world. In the pro forma, I specified that this would be an engine function, however I ended up implementing it in JavaScript as it was quicker to iterate on and made it much easier to debug. Structures must be able to have attachments which generate other substructures, and must be able to roll from a pool of potential substructures with weighted probabilities. Counters must be creatable by structures, and attachments must be able to specify counter conditions that must be satisfied for certain structures to generate. These counters must be able to be mutated by structures if they're chosen. Overlapping structures should be prevented, and the structure generator must handle this appropriately to ensure that all constraints are still met by the end of the structure generation. This is in opposition to Minecraft system, which just cancels the substructure generation and moves on regardless. Impossible situations created by unavoidable structure overlapping, or counters which mutually prevent each other from reaching zero, must be identified, and the generation must be terminated. Structures should attempt to adaptively regenerate when impossible situations are encountered by traversing up the generation tree and re-rolling previous structures. This should still terminate after a number of attempts if it can't properly generate a structure that matches all the constraints. With these goals in mind, it became time to start implementing the algorithm. The first component that I implemented was file system manipulation. My engine runs all game logic in JavaScript using the V8 engine, which is the JavaScript runtime developed by Google for the Chrome browser. Because it's meant for web environments, it doesn't expose any built-in file manipulation APIs to the script environment, as doing so might break security. For my use case, I also want to maintain security because I want users to be able to download untrusted game content and run it on their local machine without any risk of danger. So I decided to scope file system access down to specific subdirectories designated for game content. For example, a path like this might be used to access the mystructure.json file in the structures subdirectory of the RE World Edit game directory. That way, no underlying information about the host machine's file system is exposed beyond the files that are explicitly meant for the game to access. Nothing is accessible to JavaScript except for the functions that I expose to it. So I created API functions for reading and writing to files at virtual paths and alias those paths to system locations in C++. That way the system path never gets exposed to the JavaScript environment. One concern I had was if I allowed the API to traverse soft links, then it could potentially get unrestricted access to the system if it had a soft link into the root directory. This would be incredibly bad as it would allow game content to just delete the entire operating system if it was so inclined. To safeguard against this, I check every folder along a virtual path to ensure that it isn't actually a soft link outside of the mod directory. This took me a bit to get right, but I eventually made an algorithm that worked for every scenario I could think of. After that, I started to write functionality to save and load blocks from the world. I wrote a JavaScript function to take a region of blocks and store it to a file, and another function to take a file and restore those blocks into the world at a different position. At this point, it didn't handle any substructures or attachments, it just saved and loaded individual structures to the world, but it was a good proof of concept for testing file manipulation. It was also at this point that I decided to write the entire algorithm in JavaScript instead of C++, as doing so made it much easier to debug using my existing scripting API. In the future, I plan to write an implementation of this algorithm entirely in parallelizable C++ code, but that's definitely out of the scope of this study. After I created structure saving and loading, I moved on to structure attachments. So I go structure generate. Oh. oh my god, it worked. Okay, okay. So the structure generated this garden. These are two separate structures. We placed one, and then the other came with it. Um, so if like, for example, I went into home and I changed 
position here. Let's just say I set it to two for the hell of it. And then I tried to paste it again. Structure, generate, home. Now the garden's upwards. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why you'd ever want that. My initial implementation worked by having a fixed origin point for each structure and then allowing structures to have attachments which specified another specific structure to spawn at that position. The substructure would be placed so its origin exactly overlaps with the attachment point. After implementing it this way though, I learned that Minecraft's attachment system worked a lot better for what I was trying to do. Instead of a structure having a single origin point, any attachment point also doubles as an origin. This way, when choosing a structure to attach to another structure, all it has to do is find two attachments and reorient them so they're facing each other. This implementation is a lot more flexible because it allows one structure to be placed in multiple ways. For example, instead of having to have a left turn and right turn structure if you want to have paths that can branch both ways, you can just create one right turn with attachment points on both sides, and depending on which side is rolled, it'll either function as a left turn or a right turn. After implementing fixtures, I moved on to implementing counters. This was definitely the meat of the study, as it was both the most original component of the project and the most mechanically complex. I had implemented the structure generation algorithm as a recursive function which was called for each attachment in the generation tree, but that made it difficult to pass the counter state mutably downwards for substructures to read and modify. To carry counters downwards, I ended up creating a stack of counter scopes which is passed to each invocation of the structure generation function. Each new substructure adds a new counter state to the stack, and when a counter is queried or mutated, it seeks down from the top of the stack until it finds the appropriate counter. This allows parent structure counters to be modified, or new counters to shadow parent counters with the same name, depending on the counter creation behavior specified in the structure file. After creating the counter stack, I made it so each attachment could contain a list of structures it can attach to instead of just one. These attachments are selected from using a weighted random function depending on the probability specified in the structure file. I made it so that possible substructures can contain counter conditions which must be satisfied for them to be considered when rolling for the next structure, and they can also contain mutations which modify counters when they're selected. Each substructure with unsatisfied counter conditions is removed from the potential pool to generate before computing the weights, and if there are no non-zero weighted structures left, then the first zero weighted one will be selected by default. If there are no structures left in the pool at all, even ones with zero weight, the generator will consider it a fail state and won't generate anything. At this point, I had counter conditions passively implemented, but there was no overlap checking, so structures had a tendency to circle into impossible to process messes. I was also placing the blocks for each substructure as soon as it was generated, meaning it wasn't possible to cancel a structure if it needed to be regenerated elsewhere. I decided to kill two birds with one stone by fixing the overlapping problem and the delayed structure generation issue at the same time. I rewrote the structure generation algorithm to maintain a list of structures that it had already generated and the positions that they should be generated at, instead of actually placing them in the world. And then, to check collisions, I just checked the list of structures to see if anything overlaps where I'm trying to generate. I also defer placing blocks to the very end and I use the structure list to know where to place them. That way, if structure generation fails for one reason or another, I can just ignore the list instead of placing the blocks to avoid creating an invalid structure. I wasted a lot of time at this point trying to address how structures were oriented to face each other when generating. I didn't have any framework for rotating a set of blocks, so I was kind of winging it and my initial algorithms were kind of messed up. I didn't notice it before fixing the overlapping, but my code to place substructures facing a certain direction was completely busted, and substructures would frequently generate at the wrong position or orientation. Thankfully, this was just a logic error, and I just had to add the previous structure's orientation to the newly placed structure rotation instead of subtracting it. But it took me a while of trial and error to figure that out. <laughs> but after that, the structure system was pretty much done, and the finishing touch was to make it intelligently retry structure placements when an impossible condition occurred. I started carrying the depth of the recursive call through the structure generation, and made it so that if a substructure can't be placed due to overlapping or a structure failing to generate entirely, it would re-roll a different structure a number of times depending on the depth and try again. The further down the tree the structure was, the less times it would try to retry before cascading up to the parent. As I figured that typically re-rolling a structure is less likely to fix a conflict the further down the tree it was. But with that implemented, and the code slightly refactored to support saving counter values before and after each structure generation, I'd completed my implementation, and everything in my pro forma. In the background, I'll play some footage of the final system generating a couple of structures while I talk about my takeaways from the study. 
Overall, I think the counter system holds a lot of promise. Being able to constrain the generation of certain substructures by conditions set by their parents is super useful for creating more advanced structures, as I had hoped. I wish I had had a chance to explore some of the more advanced features I had hoped to get to if I had time after finishing the pro forma objectives. For example, it would make the system a lot more flexible if counters could be initialized to a random value in a range, or the result of performing arithmetic on another counter. Being able to explicitly set a counter to the value of another would also be incredibly useful. It would also be much more ergonomic if I were able to specify repeated structure pools in a separate file, as duplicating each pool for every single attachment point is very cumbersome, even for my relatively simple test structures. In the future, I'd also like to add some logic to allow structures to be more aware of the world around them, such as being able to conform to the surface level, or only generating certain substructures underground. All interesting potential explorations for future studies, I suppose. I was a bit underwhelmed by the performance of my adaptive regeneration. Rerolling structures when generation failed increased the execution time exponentially. Part of this is unavoidable, of course running the algorithm multiple times will increase the runtime, but I think I'm wasting far too much time rerolling structures way down the tree. Personally, I'm quite satisfied with what I accomplished during this process though. The addition of counters to structure generation allows the generator to be a lot more expressive and selective with the structures that it chooses to generate, without requiring any custom code to enforce per-structure constraints. There are so many different ways that counters can be applied to constrain and enforce rules for structures, which I hope I've demonstrated adequately here, and I look forward to tinkering with this system more in the future to see what I can create. I'd like to give a massive thanks to Professor Esty for giving me the opportunity to explore this topic, and I hope that my research here can prove useful to others in the future. That's all my work for this semester though, so thanks. <laughs> I've attached code snippets of the system I designed to this submission. 